So there are these there's these micro markers of you might think about them as neurological integrity that seem to predict IQ, but you've been doing neuroimaging, and I'm not as up on that. I haven't looked at that for a couple of years. So what have the neuroimagers found about brain structure and function in relationship to intelligence that you think is compelling and interesting? I'm glad you asked this, because as I was finishing the manuscript for the book, literally... The day after I turned it in, I had to ask for it back because there was this very interesting study published by a group at Yale that has uh, that used a, a fairly um, sophisticated way to look at white matter connections, functional, uh, structural white matter connections, and functional connections in the brain, um, and determining how one brain area is. Uh, functionally or structurally, structurally related to all, all other brain areas. And you uh, can put up a map of a, of a person's brain that shows from brain imaging, from MRI technology, how their brain is interconnected. Mm -hmm. And this paper said these interconnections are so reliable within a person that they're like fingerprints. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the fingerprints can predict IQ. And so, so was it density of connections, density of interconnections, or something like that? Or was there more so, something more specific going on? It can be the density of, of connections structurally, how much white matter connects this area to that area. You know, and, and there are certain brain areas where you have a lot of white matter coming in and a lot of white matter going out to other parts of the brain. They're called hubs, mm -hmm. and there are nodes that have lesser connections. And so it makes kind of, it, it certainly makes sense that being able to me make measurements of brain connectivity would be related to things like intelligence. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do you remember what some of the major hubs were? Like, are they identifiable as also as neuroanatomical areas with specific yes. functions? Oh, they're, they're definitely neuroanatomical neuro areas, um, and they're, they're what you might expect, but they, what was exciting to me is they mapped onto a, uh, a model of brain intelligence relationships that I had developed with my colleague Rex Young and published in 2007, and it's called the Parietal Frontal Integration Theory, or PFIT, of intelligence. And the idea is that the connections between the parietal lobe, which is here, and the frontal area are the key connections for intelligence. Okay, so tell us, well, tell us why you, you derived that particular theory, because, you know, people have suggested, say, alternatively, that the seat of, of higher order intelligence is basically, let's say, the dorsal lateral prefrontal right. cortex or something like that. So why specifically the, connect, the connection patterns between frontal and, and parietal areas? Well, this article in 2007 was a review article where we took every single brain imaging study we could find that included a measure of intelligence, and there were 37 such studies at the time, including some I had done as early as 1988, and others had done with much larger samples. And we just kind of qualitatively analyzed the results to see what brain areas came up in common across these studies using different measures, different imaging techniques. And we found that there, that there was not an, that not all brain areas were equally distributed. They tended to be concentrated in the front and the parietal lobe, but also we found areas in the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe that were also related to intelligence. And so we developed this model that we talked about how information would be processed and how information would flow around this set of, I think there were 18 areas all mm -hmm. And we hypothesized that people who scored high on intelligence tests would have some combination of these areas. You didn't need all of them kind of working together. But some people would have this combination, some people would have that combination. And 
if you could make measurements of, about the way information was flowing around these areas with a technology like the magnetoencephalogram, which shows changes in the brain millisecond by millisecond, then you might be able to uh, actually estimate IQ from brain images. Mm -hmm. 2007, people were trying to do this with multiple regression equations. It never really replicated. Independent replications didn't go very far yeah, yeah. because the sample sizes were relatively small. You had enormous individual differences. Yeah. But these newer techniques, these mathematical techniques of calculating brain connectivity really seem to have advanced this whole thing dramatically. So was there a map between the, the nodes that were identified in this more recent research and the areas that you guys had identified with your overarching analysis? Yes. To, to the way Rex Jung and I looked at the data, it seemed like there, there was considerable overlap. And some of the authors who we did not know personally when they wrote their papers noted that their findings were consistent with our model. Now, any, hem any hemispheric differences? We have, yes, there were, there were more on the left than on the right, but there, there were also areas on the right as well. And we, these areas tend to be areas that are also related to uh, language and memory and attention. Mm -hmm. So the more fundamental cognitive processes of language and memory and attention seem to be the, the, the architecture on which intelligence is right. built. 